why did so many people die during the Irish famine of 1845 to 1853? So, but first of all, I think it's worth me answering the question, what is the Irish famine? Um, and and, and why, what, why, why is it so important? Why, why, why should we be interested in, in studying it? Um, well, it be, it's began when phytophore infestans, which is a new potato disease, arrived in Ireland in 1845 um, and destroyed in successive year uh, the majority of the potato crop on which approximately three million people in Ireland um, um, subsisted on. Um, the excess mortality from the event lasted until 1850, about 1853. Um, it's an among the worst economic and humanitarian disasters in the modern history of the British Isles. The scholarly consensus is the Irish population fell by a quarter in just five years. One million died, 1.5 million emigrated. There is some scholarly debates about whether more people died and fewer people emigrated or whether more people emigrated and more people died. But either way, um, um, either way, whatever um, share we think died and share emigrated, about a quarter, a quarter of Ireland's population unexpectedly disappeared in five years, which is something we don't really see in Britain or Ireland ever really happening since the Black Death and medieval period. So that, that's quite an extraordinary event. Um, furthermore, Ireland's population has never recovered from this event. Ireland is the only major country in Europe with fewer people now than it did in 1845. This is unlike areas such as Ukraine and Poland, um, which had you know, famines, genocides in the 20th century, but their population has more than, more, more than recovered. Uh, well, more than recovered, excluding the population which is left in the last month because of the current war, but um, in, until, until the, the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, the Ukrainian population had recovered from their famine in the interwar years, for example, but this has not happened in Ireland. Ireland's population in 1845, the island of Ireland was about eight and a half million. Uh, today, it still, still hangs around um, only about seven. So there has been some recovery in recent years, but it's not been fully recovered. And there are consequences, um, there are other consequences other than the big drop in population. Um, this was a big economic hit to the Irish economy, the GDP of Ireland fell by 25%. And it also fueled Irish separatism, contributing towards Ireland's decision um, to go for independence from the United Kingdom in 1922, or at least for southwesterly 26 counties. Um, so the Irish famine and many other events is often presented, especially in schools, as a single narrative um, of, of events. But recent research in recent decades has reopened this sub the academic debate on this subject. And I think this is a really good subject to convey um, um, the fact that at university, history isn't about simply about writing narrative. It's about engaging with debates about the past, with multiple competing different narratives of the past. And your job, often as an undergraduate in writing an essay, is to say which version of events is least, most, most convincing and least convincing. So you're arguing about which about competing narratives and competing different arguments, interpretations of the past. And just, and deciding and arguing which ones are most convincing, which ones are least convincing, against the available evidence. It's not enough in an essay at university simply to state what the narrative is. You have to prove it and show it why is it more convincing than other interpretations. And um, the debate on the Irish family is a good example of how something that is often presented as a single narrative is in fact a quite a complex debate on which there's new interpretations and new research going on all the time. And this is what the purpose of a university is. A university is um, a place where active academic researchers who are going away and writing history books and writing articles about history also teach. And the idea of that is because, um, because they've done research on the subject, they are experts in the subject, um, they know the most recent research on the subject really well, and they can put that into their teaching. Um, and this is um, in contrast to school where um, teachers, most teachers don't do um, academic research into history and therefore don't necessarily know or cover with their students 
the most recent interpretations of research in the field. That's the big difference between university and, and school. Um, but a university is a, um, a place where researchers um, do teaching, whereas um, a school is a place where simply teachers, teachers who don't do research do teaching. Um, so what is the debate about who or what cause for famine? So first of all, there are the nationalists um, who, um, the nationalist interpretation, which has grown up since the 1860s. This is probably the one which is most popular in, 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 in comes up most, most commonly in popular discourse. Um, and most famous of which was John Mitchell, who said that the Irish famine is an artificial famine. Potatoes failed in a like manner all over Europe, yet there was no famine saved in Ireland. The Almighty indeed said potato blight that the English created the famine, i.e. it was the inadequate response of the government which caused the harvest failure to cause a famine. And more recent um, nationalists such as Tim Pat Cooden have accused um, the uh, lack of action by the British government during the Irish famine. Um, he has accused it of being a form of genocide, and um, that's often a uh, interpretation of the Irish famine, which is popular among um, Irish nationalists. Um, many Irish nationalists blame uh, the, um, um, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, the Chief Civil Servant of the Treasury, for being too, too, um, too mean fisted during the famine. Um, this is Charles Trevelyan. Um, so many nationalists um, um, and even more recent historians of the um, accused um, Trevelyan of, um, of having too much influence over policy, but um, even him, one of the more difficult figures to, to defend in history, has in recent years had the defender Robin Haynes' is, um, Charles Trevelyan, the Great Irish Famine, has sought to rehabilitate his, um, his reputation, which shows you that you can have an argument almost about anything in history. Um, so there's the nationalists who tend to argue that um, the famine was caused by um, British public policy or the inadequate British public policy response, which effectively caused a genocide in Ireland. Revisionists since the 1950s, many of whom were based at Irish universities in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, um, tend to argue the opposite. The famine was not a genocide. Uh, the famine was not due to British policy at all, and it was an, an inevitable malfusing catastrophe. Now, you might argue, um, wonder what is a malfusing catastrophe? This is the idea that population rises faster than the production of food, and eventually will end up with um, disastrous malfusing catastrophes, will end up with food shortages and famines. And the um, revisionists argue that the Irish famine is just one of these events. Um, now, this is a, this view is, is has been superseded somewhat by the post revisionist consensus. For example, Joel Mocke, who is a quantitative economic historian, tried to apply some quantitative analysis to the subject and found that there is no evidence that this was a malfusing catastrophe. Um, and in any case, Britain couldn't feed itself, wasn't producing enough food to feed its population during this period, but Britain did industry and manufacturing and sold manufacturing goods abroad to import agricultural commodities to feed its population. So by this stage, uh, the malfusion trap doesn't, didn't, didn't, um, um, it was a fear which didn't really exist because of um, the existence of international trade. And so most recent historians reject the notion that the Irish famine was inevitable of malfusing catastrophe. Instead, the post-provisionist consensus say that there wasn't intention on policymakers um, um, to, for, for people to die in Ireland. This is in contrast to nationalists who argue that uh, these policies were deliberately used, um, or an inaccurate response was deliberately used by the British government to reduce the Irish population. The post revisionists argue that that's not true, that um, there is no conspiracy um, to kill people in Ireland. In, in fact, there were, in fact, the government thought it was going to um, to it, to help the situation, save people's lives, um, but they um, were too um, motivated by laissez-faire ideology. Ideology that um, says that is um, you get the best outcomes if you leave things to the market, if you, um, you don't have government intervention. And the post-provision consensus say that these people um, were well intended, but 
um, they adopted laissez-faire policies, um, which um, meant resulted in inadequate response, which which killed people. So they argue it's ideology and laissez-faire ideology is what's what's responsible. Um, um, in particular, they contrast the um, the effective response of the first government, British government during the Irish famine, that of Sir Robert Peel, who was prime minister between 1841 and 1846, and um, the famine started in 1845. So it's the last year of that government um, um, that the Irish famine um, began. Um, Sir Robert Peel is famous for many things. He founded the London Metropolitan Police. Um, he had ginger hair, so people called him Orange Peel. Um, it was his nickname, um, um, derogatory nickname at the time. Um, um, and um, he mounted an effective policy response or a risk policy response many historians see as, see as effective. He repealed the Corn Laws, um, which were taxes on the import of foods in an attempt to make food cheaper in Ireland. He also introduced, um, he also imported food in order to make sure that there was food available for sale in Ireland. And he also um, introduced a massive scheme of public works, um, which um, was a, intended for to enable people in Ireland to um, earn money to spend on buying food. Their potatoes, um, um, you know, their potatoes might have um, failed. They um, they, they might have been infected by the disease, which would have wiped out people's source of income. So instead, they would be able to work on the public works and by the food being imported by the government, by working on the government public works. And this is widely seen as preventing excess mortality in the first year of the crisis. Um, but the repeal of the Corn Law split Peel's Conservative Party and his government collapsed in 1846. It was replaced by a minority administration of Lord John Russell's Whigs, which is the last Whig government in British history. Um, under the Whig government, um, the post provisions say that they were influenced by laissez-faire ideology. They um, shut down Peel's um, interventions and relief efforts and public work scheme, and as a result, excess mortality soared. However, in recent years, it has been pointed out that this narrative doesn't quite work when we look at the amount of money spent against when the governments were in office. Um, because as we can see here, the, during the last year of the Peel government um, only spent just under one million pounds, whereas apparently the um, tight-fisted Whig government of Lord John Russell spent four times that in its first year in office and three times that in its second year of office, um, which suggests that there was something, uh, something else going on here. But in fact, relief efforts continued to expand initially under the government after Peel, and therefore it's quite unlikely that they had preconceived ideas about wanting to shut down these relief efforts if initially their policy was to continue um, appeal policies and expand them further, even further. And you can quite see that on this chart in that you have Peel spending a million pounds in the first year, but then the two big spending years occurring under the start of the next government. So why did the Whigs U-turn, and quite clearly 1847, you can see the U-turn is 1847 to 48, and after that, the spending on Irish famine relief collapses, even though mortality in Ireland peaks in uh, the winter of 48-49. Um, so off, after, the, um, after the big bulk of the spending on the Irish famine had ended. Um, so why was there a U-turn in 47 to 48? So it's, this isn't necessarily due to the change of government in 46. But, you know, the dates don't work with what was being spent by the government. Instead, there's something in 47, 48 going on. Um, and the answer to this can be found in my new book, um, The Great Famine in Ireland, British, Britain's Financial Crisis, 
um, which is due to be released um, this October, gives an answer to this question. And it argues that there was a fiscal, financial and political crisis in Britain in 1847, which meant that the government, instead of being able to continue, continue to expand Peel's policy, the new government of Lord John Russell was forced to um, change course. Um, this is very clear when you look at the detail of what happened around the 1847 budget. So the 1847 budget actually announced an expansion of spending on Irish, um, on uh, relief, family relief for the Irish government, um, Irish relief um, um, for the famine. Um, so at the start of February um, 1847, the government announced it was going to borrow um, eight million pounds um, to spend on um, famine relief. Um, this is marked on this chart um, by the first vertical black line. Um, and this caused a financial panic in the city of London because Britain was on the gold standard. Um, there was an exchange of, um, that meant that it was a fixed um, currency against gold. And the fear was that the government was gonna borrow in banknotes to spend on the famine. Um, and then it was gonna exchange them at the Bank of England for gold. And there wouldn't be any gold left to back up the value of other banknotes in Britain. And the currency would collapse. And this meant that people um, who held um, sterling um, deposit, bank deposits and assets started liquidating those and swapping them for gold. And so um, the two measures you can see on the screen, which are both measures of financial crisis, you can see dive after this budget is announced. And it's only when the government announces that um, the poor law ratepayers in Ireland will have to pay most of um, the costs of the family relief themselves rather than it being borrowed by the government and then given or led to Ireland um, where this financial crisis abates. And you can see it's immediately after those changes are announced in which um, the situation recovers that the uh, measures, these two proxies for financial um, propensity for financial crises recover significantly. So if you look at the precise timing of events, you can quite clearly see that this related to fiscal and financial crisis in Britain, and that the timings for change in political composition of government do not link to this U-turn in policy. And there is a result um, of this um, U-turn in 1847. Um, it didn't result in pure laissez-faire. It wasn't the government did absolutely nothing, but it instead um, introduced taxes, which were paid by Irish landowners, had to pay um, taxes um, to the poor law unions who would um, um, organize um, and pay for relief in um, by a poor law system. Um, the problem is, is this revised system didn't work. The first reason why it didn't work is that many areas, the taxes needed to raise the necessary measures were really excessively high. So as you can see on the left here is in economic theory, there's a Point of um, there's a point where a tax rate reaches a certain point beyond which it's impossible to collect more money. So approximately 50%. This is because people, um, if they think they're going to have an income tax rate of above 50%, people might go, it's not worth me working more. I will instead have more, more leisure time. Or they might start hiding their um, income from the government or moving their money to other places in the world, which has lower income tax rates. And you can quite clearly see this happening during the Irish famine. Places which had tax rates of above 50 percent, so landowners who faced tax rates of more than 50 percent on their rental income, you can see these places didn't raise as much money um, um, uh, or didn't raise any extra money from these excessively high tax rates. One place in Ireland, Bellinaslow, had a tax rate of 170% on rental income, uh, 34 shillings, three and a half p in the pound. Um, yes, it only raised, as you can see on this chart, it's that dot on the far right, only raised equivalent of 30% of the rental income. Um, that they thought um, rental income, um, when in fact they were hoping to raise almost six times the level by um, um, by charging that rate of 170 percent. Um, and this caused a lot of capital flight and emigration from Ireland of the middle classes and rich. 
um, because they were fleeing these excessively high taxes. So this, this, is, this is my point. This is not laissez-faire. This is extraordinarily high levels of um, government intervention if it really high tax rates are being charged. And more than half of Ireland's poor law unions had tax rates of over 50%. Um, at the height of the famine, um, which is higher than anywhere else seen in the United Kingdom ever before. As you can see on this chart, uh, emigration to the United States, which tended to be wealthier immigration because it costs more to get to Ireland, is very much linked to the low, um, increase in the local taxes collected in each year. Um, um, so with one year lag, you can see this rise in the to local taxes collected per year, the big the black line and the dotted line is emigration to the United States. And you can see the two are very much linked. However, and um, although this policy raised some money, but not enough to feed every to feed everyone, the point is it's not simply um, that they didn't have an, enough money, it was also that they got the science wrong of how to relieve famine. So the Irish famine is the first famine in the world where the uh, majority of the foodstuffs given as famine relief were maize or back then called Indian corn, sort of sweet corn and um, turn into flour. Um, um, and as we can see from this chart, there's a very close relationship from um, the number of people who died um, because of diarrhea in workhouses um, and eating this corn. And this is because maize causes a set of diseases, pellagra and quashicor, um, um, if you only eat um, maize and, and nothing else um, for about two weeks will kill you. This is unlike other, 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 you know, eating potatoes, you can happily eat potatoes very healthily. Mashed potato is almost a universal food stuff and will keep you alive for months and months and months. But if you only eat sweet corn for two weeks, it will kill you due to plagra and um, plagra and crashy core. And that causes the distended bellies that you see in famine victims. For example, this is a child from a modern factory suffering from um, suffering from um, pellagra. Um, and it also causes diarrhea, which is what we have evidence on for what, what people died of in, in workhouses. So the point is, is that um, this is the first famine where you see maize used as a uh, relief food stuff, um, relief food stuff, um, um, and like many recent uh, famines until very recent era, you have people dying from being given the wrong food stuff rather than simply people dying because of a lack of intervention. So, in some ways, um, to conclude, the 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 mortality toll in the Irish family was so high, not because there was intention to kill Irish people, but because um, of a lack of knowledge about how the economy worked. So this is why the budget of 1847 caused a financial crisis, which ended up killing off, um, killing off, um, um, killing off the previous um, more successful plans for um, uh, the relief effort and also a lack of scientific knowledge which meant they chose the wrong food stuff to um to relieve the population and so this is not a story about intent but a story about a lack of knowledge um to um to um implement the irish famine um to implement irish relief prop properly and save as many lives as they could but i think i should stop there to give us a few minutes for a uh, a few questions. So, um, um, James, you want to um, yeah. chair the question session? So one of the one of the questions we have uh, for you, Charles, um, is how did you get um, how did you get interested in economic history? How did I get interested in economic history? This this is a very good question. Um, so um, so. I think I went into economic history because at school I had done, my A-level subjects were history, politics, economics, and maths. Um, but really to apply to a top university for economics in this country, you need double maths, which meant I couldn't apply to economics. So instead I applied for history. Um, and I found that my interest was actually, I wanted to reality do a mixture of economics and history and therefore economic history was, um, was um, was um that, that became the subject for me um so i think i, th I think that came out of which subjects i found which a level subjects of mine i found most interesting um 
um, which I hope is a factor which will help guide many of your choices about what to study at university. Um, uh, because if you're really interested in the subject, having three years to spend reading about it is a really fantastic opportunity. Um, and then as a follow up, uh, Gabrielle would like to know, um, what drew you into looking at the Irish famine specifically? What drew me into looking at the Irish famine specifically? Um, um, well, I think I think that that came from um, some research I did for my undergraduate dissertation. So all Cambridge, um, all Cambridge um, um, history undergraduates, whatever course you pick, have a um, do have an option to do a fifteen thousand word dissertation based on original research on primary sources in their third year. And um, I um, ended up writing that about the Lord Lieutenant of the island in the early 1840s, that's just before the famine, um, whose diary I found in an archive in Bedfordshire, which I visited while I was doing family history. Now, my family were all, you know, maids and gardeners and, you know, the, the, the people who, 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 who worked in, in a big house in Bedfordshire. Um, big house in, so the servant class in Downton Abbey is where my is sort of um, a representation of of the lives my ancestors lay, led. They weren't very interesting because they seemed to have happy happy lives um, in that in, in that environment. Um, but the owner of the house um, was actually far more interesting, particularly his three years in Ireland. I know historian had actually found this diary in the archive before. So I did a little project um, for my undergraduate dissertation based on the early 1840s in Ireland. And it was during that that I read the literature on the Irish famine and I found myself not that convinced by it compared to what I would already knew existed in the archives, um, which led to my project of looking at the Irish famine again, which is coming to fruition. This um, will be published this, this autumn. Um, Great. Um, so uh, Anita wants to know, uh, do you think that Peel was more helpful or was Russell more helpful and why? Um, that is a interesting question because on the surface of it fewer people died during Peel's time and this is why Peel's um, attempt at relief effort is um, attempt at um, doing famine relief tends to get a better press from historians from the Russell government under whom excess mortality surged. I think that's that doesn't really explain fully what's going on. I think much more of the responsibility lies on Peel that assessment suggests. Um, this is partly because Peel had it easier and that the, the, Irish, the um, harvest failure due to the Irish famine was less severe in 1845 than any subsequent year. So the problem was a much smaller problem. Um, but also it was very much that the Whig government struggled to deal with the situation correctly because of the legacy that Peel had le left it. Um, so Peel broke the majority party um, the Conservative Party split in half, the Whigs were a minority government, and it couldn't get a lot of its legislation through. It had bigger plans for intervention, which it just could not get Parliament to vote for. Think of Brexit parliamentary deadlock, and you're very much of the situation the Whig government faced after 1846, where no party had a majority in Parliament. And the person who caused that was the way that Peel had repealed Cornwalls and split his party. Furthermore, the reason why the financial crisis in 1847 was so severe was because of the set of legislation about the Bank of England that Peel had introduced in 1844. So Peel had left a legacy, a political, and economic and financial legacy of weak institutions, and it was those weak political and financial institutions which basically broke during the Irish famine um, and meant that the British government was unable to um unable to um implement the policies it wanted to in Ireland and that Ireland needed um in the late 1840s. So I think Peel, I'm not saying I'm not trying to you know whitewash the Russell government here. They made lots of mistakes as well and uh, they're fully responsible for those mistakes. But I think Peel gets off scot-free in many accounts of the Irish famine. And I think his legacy later in the 1840s um um, is, is very much a negative one. 
Um, Aoife, well, a couple of people have asked something, so I'm going to sort of smush some questions together, um, but essentially revolving around how Irish and British historians uh, interpret the Irish famine. Is there a difference in interpretation on the British side and the Irish side? Um, it's much more complex than you think. So, um, so um, Irish universities are actually full of revisionists. That's the, that's the funny thing in that if you want a nationalist historian, you want to get a job, um, you can't get a job at an Irish university. So Irish universities actually are actually most revisionist. It's actually British and American universities, which are most nationalist. So it's, it's a bit more the other way around than you might think. Um, I should add that, that a lot of the nationalist historians or are actually polemicists who don't have academic jobs. Um, jobs either but if we're just looking at academic historians at universities nationalists and post-revisionists tend to be in British and American institutions and revisionists tend to be in Irish ones um, uh, how do you think the Irish famine narrative is similar or different to narratives of other famine histories so for example Ukraine in the 1930s and India in the 1940s that's that's a very interesting question. I think I think Ukraine and India are separate. Well, we have to look at which which Indian which which Indian famine because there is a series of them. Um, so Ukraine is very different in that there is a deliberate intention to um, kill the Ukrainian population and wipe out an entire class of people, the Kulaks. Uh, that was a deliberate decision made by by Moscow. So the point is is for that that uh, meets the internationally defined definition of genocide as in having intention. Whereas the Irish famine, it was the government was thinking about how to save lives and how to find the money to save lives, whether that was taxing, you know, um, borrowing money um, off of the London money markets or taxing people um, to 170% of their um, tax, uh, income from, from um, rental income. Um, 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 so, Ukraine is very different because there is intention, but there is no intention in Ireland. In fact, the intention was the opposite in Ireland. India is um, India is a far more um, complex situation. It really depends on which Indian famine, um, which Indian famine uh, you look at, um, you look at. Um, um, but there is also a debate about each one about to what extent should we be blaming laissez-faire, to what extent should we be blaming incompetence, and to what extent should we be blaming this on a lack of knowledge about what was the right way to, um, to um, relieve the famine. And so there is a parallel debate to that about the Irish famine um, applying to each of the Indian famines. But I think each of the Indian famines in reality have slightly different mixes of causes. I don't think we can produce one answer History would be very boring if we just produced one answer to everything. It would be, you can imagine three years of just producing one answer to absolutely everything. Uh, it'd be easier. <laughs> it'd be, it would be easier, yeah, but not very interesting. No, I, I just... <laughs> um, and then I'm conscious of, of time, Charles, so I'll, I'll ask one more. Um, and uh, Miran asks, um, do you think that anything could have been done differently, possibly to avoid the severity of the famine at the time within the limitations of what they knew? Uh, yes. So basically, um, um, Peel should have not passed the Bank Charter Act of 1844. That's the legislation regulating the Bank of England, which contributed to the panic of 1847. And basically, he should have not repealed the Corn Laws in the way he did. So if there are other famines or other har harvest failures in Ireland and other famines of the 19th century, which were as severe as famine in terms of the loss of the crop, but there was no excess mortality. But that was because there were majority governments which could pass the necessary legislation and find the money through raising taxes, um, which needs parliamentary approval in order to fully um, you know, provide enough relief in Ireland. Um, and therefore splitting, even though repeal of the Corn Laws was intended to help Ireland by reducing food prices, by splitting the Conservative Party into two parties and meaning that there was no majority in the House of Commons for the subsequent government, meant that the legislation which needed to be passed could not be passed. Um, could, could not be passed. Um, 
Um, so that, that if Peel had not done those two things, there would have been a very different outcome in Ireland. People would still have died because they probably would have still used maize, which they, um, which is only in recent decades realised um, shouldn't be used as a famine relief food stuff. Um, um, but it wouldn't have been on the scale it scale it was. Um, it, it was. Um, um, but I mean, this split still has political consequences today because the backbenchers eventually formed what was today's modern Conservative Party, and the frontbenchers um, became the Liberal Conservatives, and eventually the Whigs merged into them to form modern day Liberal Party and Liberal Democrats. So modern day political history would look very different if the Conservative Party of 1846 did not split in that year. So 1846 is a very important moment in Irish history, in the history of the United Kingdom, um, and also the history of Britain, British political history, modern British political history. Um, Britain would look a very different country today if different decisions had been made in the 1840s. Interesting. Thank you, Charles.